This year is lining up to be one of the biggest years for fighting games probably ever. A brand new Street Fighter is coming out in just a few weeks. Tekken is throwing one reveal after another at us. Guilty Gear has a season three on the way. Multiverses is okay, moving on. And recently it was leaked that Mortal Kombat 12 isn't just on the way, but actually scheduled to release this year. This is huge. Two of the most iconic, influential fighting game franchises of all time are said to have brand new installments releasing in the same year. The FGC is about to face off in a war over which game is superior. Or we can all just learn to enjoy more than one game at a time. That would also be nice. But this got me thinking. Back in the day, I remember these two games being such bitter rivals that everyone in the arcades and on the schoolyard kept talking about how cool it would be to get a Mortal Kombat vs. Street Fighter game. In fact, in the last year, Ed Boon even said on Twitter that they actually did try to get this game made at one point, but reality can be rough sometimes, and unfortunately, all the talk of this game fell through. Well, this is Build the Roster, the show where reality doesn't exist, and we ask what would happen if that hypothetical crossover you always wanted to see finally got a fighting game. And today, in honor of these two legendary series coming out this year, we're going to build the roster for Mortal Kombat vs. Street Fighter. Welcome to Build the Roster, the show where we take a hypothetical fighting game and build our dream roster around it. And today, we're going to tackle the roster for a game I have heard people asking for for almost 30 years. Yeah, even before I was old enough to play Mortal Kombat, I remember people wanting a crossover between these two kings of the arcade. But bringing these two franchises together is no easy feat, and not just because showing any footage of Mortal Kombat on YouTube pretty much guarantees that this video is going to get demonetized. Although, speaking of that, before we get any further into this video, I just want to go ahead real quick and thank everyone who signed up for our Patreon. You guys have been great, and I'm not kidding when I say that doing a video involving Mortal Kombat pretty much guarantees that this video is going to get demonetized. So, without the support that we've gotten from everyone over on Patreon, I probably wouldn't be able to do this video today. So, thanks again to all of our patrons, and if you'd like to sign up and get some behind-the-scenes bonuses and vote on upcoming videos, then just follow the link in the description down below. And if you don't want to sign up, but you still want to help support this channel in some way, then just give this video a thumbs up, leave a comment, and hit that subscribe button. Doing that tells YouTube to share these videos around, and it really does help. But now that that's out of the way, we can get back to the show. So, as I was saying, this is a game that's been requested for decades, but I can understand why it never happened. I mean, crossovers are hard to work out even under the best conditions, but we're talking about Street Fighter, a game made by the Japanese-owned company Capcom, and Mortal Kombat, a game that can't legally be sold in Japan because it's too violent. So right there is a rather heavy roadblock. In fact, beyond just the fact that legally the two of them are being separated, just talking about the tone of these two games? Yeah, this is a crossover that would be kind of hard to pull off. I mean, at this point, you can accept pretty much any character in Mortal Kombat brutally murdering their enemies, their friends, even their own family members. But it's kind of hard to picture Chun-Li kicking a hole through someone's chest and then pretending that that's still in character. So because of that, and because I can never just jump right into the rosters in these videos, let's brainstorm for a bit. Let's actually ask, how could a Mortal Kombat vs. Street Fighter game work? If you don't want to hear any of that and just want to skip right to the roster, then just look at the description down below. But I'm going to let you guys know, us deciding how this game would work will actually decide what characters go into this roster. So it is kind of an important thing to figure out. For starters, let's address the biggest issue, the gore. Yeah, Mortal Kombat is very well known for its excessive violence and graphic brutality. Street Fighter? Eh, not so much. So, how do we strike a balance between these two? Well, we kind of already have an answer to that question in another Capcom franchise, Resident Evil. That game is also fairly bloody and brutal. Outside of Japan. In Japan, they heavily censor the game, but in the international releases, they let the red stuff flow. So, let's just have a setting in the game for the gore, and players can turn it on and off. But in countries that would have a problem with the gore being in the game at all, they only get a version of the game with the gore always turned off. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, okay, that works for the normal combat because you can just keep the blood from spilling out when a character gets hit. 
but how do you turn off gore in fatalities? Symbol, don't have fatalities. Okay, hold up. I know you guys are jumping in right now to argue why that's a bad idea, and I understand. Fatalities are a staple of Mortal Kombat. It's one of the things that defines this series. It's in the game's DNA, which is also something those fatalities spray everywhere. If you have a Mortal Kombat crossover, you need fatalities. But having a Street Fighter character just go up to a helpless defeated opponent and then murdering them is, uh... kind of clashing with the tone of the World Warriors. So I think there's a balance we can strike here, something that lands comfortably between these two series by looking outside of them to a totally different game. <laughs> yep, you want something to finish off your opponent while keeping it in the actual combat itself? Give the characters insta-kill moves. Let's say every character in the game has some kind of a big super. Typical stuff for a fine game, something that uses up meter to do big damage. But let's say if you use that super to finish off the opponent, then it has an extra step added onto it. For example, Ryu's big super would be his Shinku Hadoken, just a big energy beam that he fires out of his hands. But if you finish the opponent off with it, then the moment that their life bar hits zero, it then goes into an additional animation where Ryu pours on some extra juice, Coming up the power of his beam, and we see the enemy being vaporized inside the attack until there's nothing left. That way, you still get some kind of a finishing move, in fact it's now similar to the brutalities in Mortal Kombat X and Mortal Kombat 11, and it's part of the combat so it feels a little more appropriate for the Street Fighter cast rather than just having them walk up to a defeated opponent and ripping their brains out. And for the countries where the blood and gore would get this game banned, just have a non-fatal version of the finishing move. In America, you have Chun-Li beat someone with her Hoyukusen, she kicks them a hundred times and then finishes it by kicking their head off. In Japan, she just does her normal Hoyukusen and then finishes it with a big colorful background explosion matching how it looks in Street Fighter when you finish a player with a critical. And that extra slowdown and big flashy burst would last as long as the fatality animation, so it wouldn't be a problem when you play people online who are playing on a different setting. And for anyone thinking, oh, but these big supers wouldn't look good if you didn't turn on the violence, just look at how bad the brutalities were in Mortal Kombat vs. DC. Uh. Oh, oh shit. Yeah. Oh, damn, dude, that yeah. guy got bodies. Yes, those finishers were bad, but not because they weren't bloody, they were bad because they were bad. But it's been a few years since that game, and if you take a look over at the Injustice games... <laughs> yeah, I think it's safe to say that Netherrealm has figured out how to make really cool looking supers without needing blood or gore. And you can use this same censorship technique with another mechanic that would merge two different abilities from these games. In Mortal Kombat, you have the X-Ray attacks. Big attacks where they brutally damage the opponent and the camera makes sure to zoom in on the bones crunching and snapping in ways that make you really wonder why these characters aren't already dead. Like, what exactly is a fatality going to do to this person that this attack didn't already accomplish? I literally saw their brain getting lobotomized and the fight is still going on. I don't really understand why the fatality is necessary at this point. Well, let's merge that with something that the Street Fighter games are known for. EX moves. Mortal Kombat also has their own version of EX moves, but considering that Street Fighter has had them around for several generations now, I consider it to be a more distinctly Street Fighter mechanic so I think merging these two would fit very well. Let's say if you spend some of your meter when performing a super, you'll do an extra powerful version of that move. But in this game, when you do that EX move, the camera will also zoom in to show the X-ray damage to the opponent. For example, let's say Zangief does his famous spinning pile driver on the opponent. But if it's an EX version of that move, then when he lands on the ground, the camera will zoom in to show the opponent's skull and neck cracking as it slams into the dirt. But if it's the Japanese version of the game, then the camera will still zoom in, but we won't show the x-ray, we won't show the bones actually snapping. Instead, we can put a filter on there to change up the colors, make some big effects pop out of it, something else that still gives off an effect, but not really a brutal will force this game to be banned in other country style of effect. 
So, now that we've addressed the big bloody elephant in the room, there's another question people have about Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter crossing over. How would it play? Yeah, Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter share some similarities, but are incredibly different in some key ways. So, which playstyle would this game lean into? Simple. Both. Yeah, this isn't the first time that Street Fighter crossed over with another fighting game series with its own unique playstyle. In Capcom vs. SNK, they introduced a groove system, where you could select different playstyles that lined up with various Capcom or SNK titles. So let's create a Mortal Kombat groove and a Street Fighter groove. You get to pick which one you want, and now you can have the characters play like whichever game you prefer. For example, if you pick the Mortal Kombat groove, then characters will be able to run and you'll have to hold a button to block. You pick the Street Fighter groove and you'll be able to do a dash and you'll be able to hold back to block. You pick the Mortal Kombat groove and all of your special attacks are mapped to basic directional inputs. You pick Street Fighter and they're all linked to motions. Sure, it would take some balancing to make sure that one groove wasn't stronger than the other, but... Well, I got news for you. It's a fighting game. There's always going to be a need to balance whatever mechanic you decide to put in there. But we can take this one step further. The groove system is a uniquely Street Fighter mechanic. However, Mortal Kombat has their own system similar to this. In Mortal Kombat X, they introduced variations to characters. Each character had three different versions that would include some new abilities and moves and in some cases would alter their appearance, allowing you to have more freedom with each character and how you wanted to play as them. So, let's say the Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter groups wouldn't just include new mechanics for each character, but would also include one or two different moves between each groove, and some slight visual differences. Again, I know this sounds like a lot of work, but as I said, Mortal Kombat already has a system just like this in MKX. We could totally do this again. Also, by providing these different playstyles, it would allow people to play characters they might never have checked out before. Let's say you never really picked up Mortal Kombat because you hated the input system and the block button. Just pick the Street Fighter groove and now you can enjoy Scorpion and Sub-Zero and all these other classic MK characters for the very first time. So alright, I think we finally answered how a game like this could work. But before we start building this roster, there's one more question that we have to address. How big is this roster going to be? When it comes to crossing over two fine game franchises, there's two things that you need to keep in mind. First, the roster size has to be larger than the most recent installment of either game. I mean, let's say Mortal Kombat 11 launched with 25 characters, but this spin-off launches with only 20. It's hard to tell someone to pick this game up when they can get even more characters from the game that came out five years ago. But at the same time, you don't want either side of this crossover to have a bigger roster than the roster of their individual games. And by that, I mean Street Fighter V launched with 16 characters and Street Fighter VI is going to launch with 18. So if Mortal Kombat vs. Street Fighter came out and there's 20 Street Fighter characters in here, then it would suddenly be hard for me to tell people to go and buy Street Fighter VI if they can get more characters in here. So in other words, you want this crossover to be large enough that there's a reason to buy it over the individual games, but not so large that there's now suddenly no reason to buy the individual game. So what that means is that the last Mortal Kombat game launched with 25 characters, so the roster has to be larger than that. But Street Fighter VI is going to launch with 18 characters, meaning the roster has to be less than 36. So between 25 and 36, right there in the middle, is the nice even number of 30. However, I'm going to go a tiny bit further than that because Mortal Kombat loves to include unplayable boss characters and pre-order bonus characters, so I'm going to throw in two more boss characters who could be unlocked as pre-order bonuses, bringing our grand total up to 32. So, 15 characters on each side and one extra boss slash pre-order bonus character for both teams. However, I'm going to throw in one extra rule when putting this roster together. Even though the game wouldn't be as bloody as Mortal Kombat, it would still be pretty brutal. So, I'm going to try and pick characters who could fit the tone of this game. So, characters that you could picture going toe-to-toe -to -toe in more violent settings. For example, Sakura is a great popular character. But I can't really picture her ripping a character's throat out, so she's not going to make it. And on the other side of that coin, I'm going to try and pick Mortal Kombat characters who feel like they would fit in a Street Fighter game, even if it's a more violent Street Fighter. In other words, Aaron Black, very popular character. People really dig Aaron Black. But all his moves involve guns, and I don't really see someone walking into the World Warrior Tournament and pulling out a six-shooter. 
I guess you could say the same thing for Stryker, but nobody likes Stryker, so he wasn't going to make the cut to begin with. So with all that laid out, let's go ahead and build the roster for Mortal Kombat versus Street Fighter. Ryu, Ken, and Chun-Li. Okay, normally we do one character at a time, but let's be real. This is a crossover game that's specifically about Street Fighter characters. You all knew these three were going to be in here. If you're making a new Street Fighter game, mainline or spinoff or crossover or whatever, these are the three characters who have to be up there. They are the three faces on Street Fighter Mount Rushmore, and the fourth face is just a Hadouken. Plus, you could do something really interesting with them in this game using the Groove variation. As I said, there would be two variants for each character, a Mortal Kombat version and a Street Fighter version. And Mortal Kombat is a series full of black magic and evil sorcerers and literal hell worlds. It's a much darker universe than Street Fighter. Well, Ryu, Ken, and Chun-Li all have evil variants of themselves. Ryu has evil Ryu, Ken has violent Ken, and Chun-Li has Shadow Lady. So let's say if you pick the Mortal Kombat group for them, then each character turns into their darker version. Again, they would mostly change visually. They would get one or two different moves in addition to their different playstyle, so it wouldn't be like programming a totally new character into the game, but it would be a great way to sneak in these variants while leaning into the unique groove system of this game. In fact, you could have that play into the story as well. Let's say one of the big bags from Mortal Kombat corrupts the Street Fighter heroes, and now you get these evil variants in the story itself. And in case anyone was wondering if Capcom actually owned Shadow Lady since she came from the Marvel vs. Capcom games, Capcom has already used her as a bonus fight in Street Fighter V, and she appeared as a card in Tepin. They own her, she can be in this game. The Nether Realm. This is where I was reborn. This is where you will pay! Sub-Zero and Scorpion. Just like how if you're doing a game that crosses over with Street Fighter, you need Ryu, Ken, and Jun Li. If you're doing a game that crosses over with Mortal Kombat, you need Sub-Zero and Scorpion. These two are the faces of the series, the two most popular characters. Their movesets and designs are legendary. At this point, I'm just trying to fill time because there's not much to say because it's that obvious they should be in this game. And they fit into the variation groove system very nicely. As I said, Mortal Kombat is a darker game than Street Fighter, so the Mortal Kombat crew could see the Street Fighter characters in a darker light, but flip that around, and that means the Street Fighter crew could give us a lighter version of the Mortal Kombat characters. So you pick the Mortal Kombat crew for Scorpion, and you get Demon Scorpion. Pick the Street Fighter crew, and you get Human Scorpion. Again, he'd get a few new moves here or there, but also you could alter his voice a little to give him that demonic echoey effect in the MK crew. And for Sub-Zero, have the MK group be Bi Han, the original Sub-Zero, and have the Street Fighter group be Kwai Liang, the second and more noble Sub-Zero. Then again, Bi Han went on to be Noob Saibot, so maybe you could just make the MK Sub-Zero the older classic looking Sub-Zero, and the Street Fighter version the older Sub-Zero. Either way, you've got some options. Heck, you could even have each character have different endings in the arcade mode depending on which version of them you select in order to encourage replayability. Sung, only one fight remains. Face me in Mortal Kombat. Liu Kang. I knocked out three Street Fighter characters in a row, so let's go ahead and get a third MK character out of the way too. Liu Kang was the hero of the first several Mortal Kombats, and even after Ed Boon decided to kill him off, and then reboot the universe, and then kill him off again, and then make Liu Kang an evil magical zombie, he was still always an important part of the series. He even got a big redemption and hero send-off in MK11 as he spoiler alert for MK11, becomes the new Elder God of the World and reboots the universe. Uh, again. Yeah, Mortal Kombat 12 is going to be really interesting. But hey, no matter what they decide to do with Liu Kang in the future, whether he becomes the new Raiden or he walks off into the sunset forever, if we're including the biggest MK characters, he has to be in here. And considering the last game ended with him rebooting the universe, that would be the perfect excuse for a crossover between these series. Just say something went wrong when creating this new timeline and now the barrier between his reality and the Street Fighter reality are clashing. That could even be a great excuse for different variations of characters or bringing in characters from the past. 
And just think about some of the character interactions. You know where you would want to learn some of the teachings of Liu Kang's temple. Not the one we're looking for. Cammy, you want to talk about a Street Fighter character who would fit perfectly in a Mortal Kombat game? It's the one who was a Special Forces agent turned assassin. First off, Mortal Kombat is low with special military people who assemble specifically to fight back against the forces of Outworld. Cammy's special military group was assembled specifically to fight Shadowloo. The Interpol team from Street Fighter teaming up with a Special Forces team from Mortal Kombat makes way too much sense to not happen. But you also want some more deadly fighters, and yeah, Cammy was brainwashed by M. Bison to become an assassin, and you still keep several of those old killer moves with her. We all remember that next snap animation from the old Street Fighter animated movie. Heck, Capcom remembers it so much they made it her new super in Street Fighter 6, and that would be the perfect move to turn to a finisher. And for the two different versions of her, this is another easy one. Modern day or classic Cammy is the Street Fighter groove, the blue Killer B Cammy is the Mortal Kombat groove. She just fits way too well to not put it in here. Lieutenant Blade, reporting for duty. Here for another scuffle. Ready to rumble, Major. Sonya Blade. And then we come to Cammy's counter on the Mortal Kombat side. If you were here last year when we did the Tekken Cross Street Fighter Builder roster, you may remember I tried to give every character a rival fight. But I'm not going to do that here just because there's so much more variety between Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat characters. However, there are still just those matchups that work too well to not pit against each other. And Cammy and Sonya Blade would make an awesome pair. They are a team that has to face off with each other in the story mode and then end up working together later on. Plus, Sonya is a legend. She's been in this series since the start. Of course she deserves to be in this big crossover, and she's going to bring some reinforcement with her. Jax. Sonya isn't the only Special Forces agent to be included, you gotta go with Jax as well. Another staple of the series, his big robotic arms are so iconic and he's been a major part of the story in multiple games. Listen, I'll be honest with you, I don't have that much to say about this one simply because we're still so early in this video that all my choices still make way too much sense. I don't really have to defend Jax because if you want a Mortal Kombat game, you kinda need Jax. The last MK game to not have Jax in it was Deception. And even then he got added to the PSP version of the game, so yeah, he's still practically batting a thousand here. As for the two different variations, Jax has always been a grappler, but grapplers in Mortal Kombat and in Street Fighter work very differently, so this would be a great opportunity to really experiment and show off the differences between these two grooves, how a character can have similar moves in each of them, but they still work in completely different ways. For example, in the Street Fighter groove, yeah, some of his grapples are going to require that 360 input, which is hard to do. But because it's hard to do, maybe it'll reach further, maybe it'll do more damage, maybe it'll have quicker startup. Again, Jax is just a great character to show off how these two grooves can be different. And speaking of grapplers... Zangief. Yeah, if you're going to talk about grapplers, you can't ignore the King OG grappler himself. This guy is the face of grapplers. If the grappler nation had a currency, he'd be on the dollar. Give me five geefs for a pot, you'd say. Okay, seriously though, Zangief is another big face for Street Fighter and one of the most famous grapplers of all time. He has to be in here. But I've got another reason to include him, and this one kind of gets into weird crossover story ideas. In the Marvel vs. Capcom games, there was an unlockable version of Zangief called Mech Zangief, which was meant to be a prototype built by Shadowloo to fight Zangief. 
Since then, Mech Zangief has gone on to be an alternate skin for Zangief in Street Fighter, as well as making a cameo in the background in Street Fighter Cross Tekken. Oh wow, so it seems like anytime Street Fighter crosses over into something, Mech Zangief makes an appearance. But... Nah, that won't work here. It's not like Mortal Kombat has an entire plotline that revolves around characters getting turned into robots. Oh, wait! Yeah, one of the storylines in MK is all about the Lin Kuei ninjas being turned into cyborgs. So let's say that at one point in the storyline, Zangief gets turned into Mech Zangief. Or, heck, just have that be his arcade ending if you pick the MK group. I mean, you got a robot version of Zangief, who always appears in crossovers, and they're crossing over with a franchise known for turning people into robots. This alone justifies this entire crossover. We defend Kronika as she rewrites history. Cyrax. So, if we're messing around with the whole characters who were turned into robots storyline, then maybe we should include, you know, one of the characters who was turned into a robot. Which means our options are Cyrax, Sector, Smoke. Although, in this new timeline, I don't think he ever got turned into a robot. But then again, he does appear as part of Triborg. Then again, I don't know if Triborg is canon or not? You know what, this is getting way too complicated. We're just going to stick with either Cyrax or Sector. And seeing as how I'm sticking with this idea that there are two grooves and one is a dark side and one is a light side, and wow, I just realized at one point we really do need to do a Star Wars Builder roster, I'm going to go with Cyrax because at one point he was a brainwashed cyborg soldier, but then he managed to free himself of this programming and became a hero, so he fits both grooves perfectly. Or, I mentioned Triborg earlier, Maybe we can take a cue from Triborg and actually include both Cyrax and Sector and make Sector the Mortal Kombat groove and Cyrax is the Street Fighter groove. I mean, after all, as I said, Ryu, Ken, and Chun-Li are basically two characters in one thanks to their grooves. Cyrax and Sector sharing a spot would be a great way to balance that. To see one's fate, one must fight their future. Only one who can see their future can truly understand one's fate. Rose. For our next Street Fighter character, we should pick another one who could fit into the themes of Mortal Kombat. And as I've already pointed out, there's a whole lot of magic in the MK universe. In the Street Fighter universe, not so much. There's really only two magical characters in Street Fighter, Rose and her protege Minot. And Minot is too wholesome for a game where people are ripping each other's spines out. Rose, on the other hand, has seen some stuff. And she's taken on the role at times of being someone who warns others of oncoming doom, and if realities are clashing, yeah, she'd be the one to pop up and start warning everyone about. Plus, if you want to get really deep on this, at the end of her story mode in Street Fighter V, she talks about sending a message to herself back in time right after the events of the first game to try and change history which makes me think someone at Capcom played Mortal Kombat 9 and really hoped that nobody else at the company would realize they were stealing that idea straight from that game because yes, Raiden did that exact same thing in Mortal Kombat 2011. So guess who's next? Raiden. Yeah, this was a no-brainer. Even among all the other no-brainers on this list, this is still a no-brainer. Raiden is the Elder God who has been watching over Earthrealm and trying to protect it from the encroaching other realities. So if another reality is encroaching on Earthrealm, he's going to show up. The only problem is that at the end of MK11, again, spoiler warning for MK11, he loses his powers as Liu Kang becomes the new Guardian, and as I said, Liu Kang resetting the universe would be a great excuse for why these realities are colliding. So, how is Rain going to be in here? Well, first off, that was just a suggestion that we use that as a plot point. We can totally ignore it. But even if we don't, 
This is a franchise that has used time travel to reset its universe twice within three games. You can totally come up with an excuse for why Raiden would have his powers back. Either he gets them back temporarily as a result of these realities merging, or a past Raiden comes through some kind of a time portal, or an alternate reality Raiden appears. There's so many choices that you can go with. Plus, I would love to see the interactions between Rain and Rose. Like, let's say in Rose's ending, she talks to Rain about her plan to send a message to herself using her magic backwards in time to reset her universe. I would love to see Rain just look at her and go, okay, a couple of things about that plan. First off, be specific. Use proper nouns in your message. Don't just assume your past self is going to know what you're talking about. Plus, Rain is another character who has had both good and bad versions of himself before in the official canon, so he fits the two group system very well. Bow down before my psycho power. M. Bison. Time we get some villains in here, and if we're talking Street Fighter villains, M. Bison is easily the biggest name in the game. He's been the main bad guy in three out of their six games, and in another game, his robot clone was the bad guy, and in the upcoming Street Fighter VI, the new threat looks to be some guy named JP who uses purple energy like Bison and is talking about someone who was looking for a vessel for this power. Yeah, he's just using Bison's power, so I'm going to give him like half a point on this one. And Bison fits great into this game because about half of the villains in Mortal Kombat are obsessed with souls. You know that when they see Psycho Power, they're going to lose their minds. Psycho Power is like the energy drink of souls. I can think of at least one MK character who would want to get their hands on that. What is this supposed to be? Your own design. A mirror match. You mirror my style, but not my skill. Shang Tsung. From the original Street Fighter boss to the original Mortal Kombat boss. Actually, the original Street Fighter boss was Sagat, but nobody talks about the first Street Fighter game, so I'm still going to call this a fair comparison. Shang Tsung, even after losing his boss status, continued to be one of the biggest recurring baddies in Mortal Kombat, and as we saw in MK11, he loves taking advantage of crumbling realities to be super manipulative. If you want someone in your game who could trick Street Fighter characters into fighting the heroes of the MK world, it's Shang Tsung. Plus, as I said, the moment this guy sees Bison's psycho powers, he wouldn't be able to keep himself from licking his lips and rubbing his hands together. He would drink that power up with a straw if he could. I'm picturing for this game that we'll have two bosses, a Street Fighter boss and a Mortal Kombat boss. But if you did want to go with some kind of a fused amalgamated boss, a buffed up Shang Tsung with swirling purple energy who fights just like Bison did back in the Alpha games would fit pretty well. And sticking with the idea of including a Mortal Kombat and a Street Fighter version of these characters, there's actually two options we have here. You can either have old Shang Tsung be one groove and young Shang Tsung be another groove, or Shang Tsung has the ability to transform into other characters if you want to get really nuts, you can make it so that in the MK groove, Shang Tsung transforms into MK characters who didn't make it into the game. And in the Street Fighter groove, he transforms into Street Fighter characters who didn't make it into the game. Heck, if this game includes friendships, let's say in the Street Fighter groove, his friendship is him just turning into Dan Hibiki and doing his long Dan taunt. Vega. You can't just have the big bosses in your crossover game, you need at least one or two henchmen in here, and between Vega, Balrog, and Fong, Vega fits Mortal Kombat saying the best. Balrog is just a greedy corrupt boxer who will work for whoever pays him, and Fong is… well, Fong, but Vega is a sociopathic serial killer who loves slashing people up with his claws. On the list of Street Fighter characters who feel like you could just pick them up and drop them down into Mortal Kombat, Vega is way up there. I'd list off which of his specials and supers could be turned into his finishing move, but the answer is just… all of them. 
have him slice right through the opponent, and in the Japanese version of the game, a bunch of rose petals comes out. In the international uncensored version, well, it's something else that's red. Can you prove you're one of us? You'll know from the taste of my blades. Spoken like a true Tarkatan. Baraka. Time to give you a bit of a behind the scenes peek of this video. Baraka was the last character I put on this list because, yes, he is a staple of Mortal Kombat. He's one of the faces of the series, and boy, what a face it is. But he's also probably the biggest jobber in the history of fighting games. He's the guy who gets beat up by the heroes because well, you gotta have the heroes beat up somebody before they get to the final boss. So, yeah, I knew he was important, but I didn't think he was big enough to include in this very limited number of characters. But I decided to listen to everyone else on this one, so I put out some feelers, I went out on Twitter, and I asked some Mortal Kombat fans what they thought about Baraka, and boy was I shocked to see that this guy has stands up the wazoo. Baraka apparently does have a fan base, and they are here to support him. So, you know what? You guys convinced me. He gets in. Plus, as I said, you do need someone for the heroes to beat up, so throw Baraka and 20 other Tarkatan soldiers who look just like him in here, and bam, you got yourself a story mode. Okay, that was a joke. Eh, mostly. But real talk, you want to know the big reason to include him? Because I just put Vega in here. You need a scene of these two clashing their long claws with each other, while Vega, a man obsessed with beauty, says Baraka is the ugliest thing he's ever seen while Baraka tries to chew his face off. And speaking of beastly fighters... Blanca. Another one of the classic world warriors, Blanca is another one of those characters who feels like they could easily come from the world of Mortal Kombat, and for once, I don't just mean they're violent. No, in fact, Blanca is actually a good boy. He's actually very kind and optimistic. Although he does have his angry side every now and again, so you could have the Mortal Kombat groove be a more savage version of the character, while the Street Fighter groove leans more into the modern day Blanca. But what I mean when I say he feels like he could come from the world of Mortal Kombat, is Blanca is one of the only monster characters in Street Fighter, while Mortal Kombat is loaded with them. If this guy had originally popped up in Mortal Kombat, and they said that he was a creature from Outworld, none of you would have questioned it. So yeah, put Blanca in here and do something in the story mode where he gets lost in Outworld, but nobody even bats an eye at him or thinks he's different. Or heck, get really weird with it and have him discover a temple with a statue of a monster that looks just like him, and people in Outworld start worshipping him like a god or he even finds a whole race of monsters that look just like him. I mean, he's already one color swap and a shave away from looking like Moloch. This would totally work. I did not expect to fight in this tournament. But eventually, even the Shaolin produce a warrior worthy of the Shokan. I know who you are. I am ready for you. I will give you a warrior's death. Goro. Speaking of monsters from Outworld, you need some bigger threats for our heroes to overcome. A mid-boss, if you will. And Goro is arguably the most famous mid-boss in fighting game history. A good mid-boss should decide whether or not you're worthy of facing the final boss, and Goro is going to make sure not everyone makes that cut. And in your crossover fighting game story mode, you need that first big threat, that thing that's going to finally force our heroes from both worlds to team up. And in a game like this, that's Goro. And as for his two variations, remember despite being a big brutish figure, Goro is also a prince. So let's have the Mortal Kombat group be his standard version we're more familiar with that puts a greater focus on grappling and smacking the opponent around, and his Street Fighter variant would be a more regal version, something that really leads into his princely status, and it would include things like his fiery projectiles. Hello. 
何者じゃ我は剣を清めし者なりアクマ So, if Goro is the big non boss threat from the Mortal Kombat side, who's the big non boss threat from Street Fighter? It's the character you all immediately thought of as soon as you saw the title of this video. Listen, I know I've said many times now this Street Fighter character would fit in Mortal Kombat, but if I could take all of those back and save it for just one character, it would be Akuma. Not only does he specialize in a martial arts based all around murder, he only has one goal in life. To find strong opponents and fight them to the death. Heck, out of all these super moves in Street Fighter that you could turn into finishing moves in this game, the Raging Demon is hands down the best candidate. As for his two variants, the Street Fighter version is the regular Akuma, and the Mortal Kombat version is Oni, the Akuma who somehow managed to become even more evil. In fact, you know what? Akuma would fit so well in a Street Fighter Mortal Kombat crossover. I'm going to break from the rest of this video right now just to go on a little tangent and say, put Akuma in Mortal Kombat 12. I am being 100% serious about this. I want this to happen. Ed Boon is crazy for guest characters, and after he popped up in Tekken 7, I love the idea that Akuma is just becoming this traveling warrior who roams from franchise to franchise just to say, I'm going to break into your fighting game and make you feel unsafe. If there is even a slight tiny chance that someone from Netherrealm might end up seeing this video, please just start sliding subtle hints to Ed Boon about putting him in the game. I don't care if it's just leaving sticky notes around the office or whispering Akuma to him while he sleeps, we need to make this happen. Who's next? Oh, I'm next, Hollywood. Go back to the nineties, Johnny Cage. All right, we got a good chunk of villains out of the way. Time to head back to something a bit more lighthearted. Crossovers are supposed to be fun, they can't be all doom and gloom, and if you want someone to bring a good time to your game, it's Johnny Cage. Plus, Johnny has maybe had one of the biggest glow ups in fighting game history. He went from jokey movie star to being one of the leaders of the War on Outrealm. And I've been talking all this time about Street Fighter characters who feel like they could fit into the Mortal Kombat world. Johnny Cage feels like he would fit perfectly into the Street Fighter world. If he had popped up in an early Street Fighter game as a rival action star to Fei Long, it would have worked great. In fact, you know what? If you pick the Street Fighter group for him, then that could be his arcade ending. Have him get cast opposite Fei Long in an action movie, and now he's trying to show him up. This is our destiny. My secret art gets g o t Jamie. Okay, here comes a weird pick because Jamie is a brand new character from Street Fighter VI, and at the time of recording, Street Fighter VI still hasn't come out yet. So, this is half me making a lot of assumptions and half me trying to future proof this episode and keep it from joining the ever growing pile of poorly aged videos I've made. Remember when I said that we were probably never going to get another Fatal Fury? Boy, that takes me back. But Jamie has been in the open betas, so we know how he's going to play. He definitely looks like he's going to be a big deal in the story mode, almost seeming like the rival to the game's new poster boy Luke, and I've certainly seen a fanbase for him popping up already, so it feels like he's a good pick. But also, I just think he's a good fit for a Mortal Kombat crossover because A, have you seen his level 3 critical art? It looks like he rips your throat out. Just put a stream of blood in there, and boom, you already got your Mortal Kombat fatality ready to go. And B, he's a drunken fighter, and Mortal Kombat has a legendary drunken fighter character. Who will not be in this roster? Yeah, sorry, I know Ed Boon finds this guy hilarious, but, uh. I can't get with you on this one. Bo Rai Cho will not be making a playable appearance in here. But he would be a great character to pop up in Jamie's arcade ending. You pick the Mortal Kombat group for him, and his story ends with him learning new drunken master techniques from this legendary teacher? Yeah, that just makes sense to me.
familiar face. We look alike, we don't fight alike. So you know I'm better. Takeda. Since we got one of the new generations of Street Fighter characters, we should also include one of the new generations of Mortal Kombat characters. And that means one of the Kombat Kids. For anyone who doesn't know, Mortal Kombat X did a time skip and introduced four characters who were all related to previous MK fighters. And there's kind of been a debate over how well the fanbase has accepted them, but I've mostly seen positive reactions. And I'll admit, I always love the idea of legacy characters, new heroes who were inspired or trained by the older characters, I'm all for it. So I had to pick one of them, and Cassie and Jackie were in MK11, so they already got a second chance in the spotlight, which means I wanted to give an opportunity to either Takeda or Kung Jin. And I definitely think Takeda was way more popular. Probably because Kung Jin uses a bow and arrow, whereas Takeda uses a mech suit and robo whips. You show a group of people those two different weapon loadouts, and I think about five out of six of those people are going to end up picking the mech suit. Plus, he's the son of Kenji, and he was trained by Scorpion, so he's got two very interesting sides to his upbringing, and you can divide these powers and abilities up nicely between the two groups. A city where no one has to fight. A city free from violence. A city without fear. <laughs> yeah. Give me a break. I thought I was fighting for peace in this city. Look where it got me. The drag, man. Cody. Alright, we're getting close to the end of the roster now, and so far, every Street Fighter character I've included has either been a staple or someone who could fit the tone of Mortal Kombat. We need to get more interesting choices in here before we close this thing out. We need to get some characters who wouldn't be the obvious choices. And first up, I'm going with Cody. Final Fight is such a big part of the Street Fighter universe, especially with the new game being set in Metro City and all the characters that got added as DLC in the last game. Yet when you list off the main Street Fighter characters, the big iconic faces of the series, they're rarely at the front of the line. But Cody has been around and grown enough in these games to be worth including. And he fit the group variation system very well. You go with the Mortal Kombat groove, and he's in his prison uniform, and he has moves where he pulls out his knife. You pick the Street Fighter groove, and he's Mayor Cody, and he has moves where he pulls out a pipe. And you know what? Cody isn't even the only Final Fight character I'm going to include in here. Poison. Yeah, I'm gonna stick with Street Fighter for now and throw in another character who might not be one of the big faces of the series, but they're certainly a favorite. Poison has only been in two Street Fighters and one crossover, and yet she's still got a huge fan base. And she's a unique enough pick that if she was announced for this game, people would perk up and pay attention, which is the goal of a good roster. And once again, I can easily see her fading in with the MK characters. She might have gotten good in the last game, but up until then, she was a member of the band of Street Thugs, the Mad Gear Gang. So, let's say if you pick her Street Fighter groove, then you get the good modern day version of Poison, who quit crime to become a wrestling promoter, and maybe you get a more humorous ending where she tries to get Goro to join her wrestling league. But if you pick the Mortal Kombat groove, then you get the Mad Gear version of Poison, and maybe she gets some moves like her Poison Cocktail, where she starts lobbing Molotovs across the screen. By the way, it's just hitting me right now, this way into the video, that translating the two different V-triggers from Street Fighter V into the two different variation systems works incredibly well. But as I was saying, if you pick the MK groove, then it's the Mad Gear Poison, and her arcade ending sees her leaving the Mad Gear to go and join Mortal Kombat's own brand of underground street thugs, the Black Dragons. But if you do that, then you probably need to include one of the members of the Black Dragons in this game, and you all know where I'm going with this. Keep bugging the whole plan, mate. Better to die with honor. What good's honor if you don't get paid? Kano. Another villain who just has to be in here to cause mayhem, Kano isn't just one of the original MK characters who has continued to stick around for almost every single sequel, but he'd also work perfectly in a story like this because there's all kinds of trouble that he can cause the Street Fighter teams. As I just said with Poison, you could have him trying to recruit the Mad Gear gang to join the Black Dragons, 
but you could also have him go off on his own and have M. Bison recruit him to work for Shadowloo, and now he and Vega are the one-two punch of villainous mercenaries chasing our heroes down. I can totally see Chun-Li finding out about the Black Dragons and wanting to bring them to justice, leading to a big confrontation between her and Kano. And as for his two variations, Mortal Kombat Groove would play a little bit more like his cutthroat variation from MKX, pulling out knives to attack, and the Street Fighter Groove would be a little bit more of a zoner. He would lean more into projectiles, such as his eye laser, as he would focus more on his cybernetic side. Charlie Nash. Before we're done here, I need one more wildcard pick to balance out all these safe choices. I'm sure everyone would have pictured Guile making it in before Nash, but I'm still going to go with his former commanding officer for a few reasons. One is that Nash was a large part of Street Fighter V, and even though it is very unlikely that we'll ever see him again in a new Street Fighter, it is a good idea to take someone who was a big deal in the last game and put them in your crossover. But most importantly, say it with me everyone, he fits the tone of Mortal Kombat. In Street Fighter V, Nash was resurrected from the dead as a ticked off Frankenstein. You all know where I'm going with this by now. Have the Street Fighter group be Nash as a human with a little more focus on his alpha play style, and have the Mortal Kombat group be the Frankenstein style Nash and have a little bit more focus on his Street Fighter V play style. Heck, you could even say the reason he's back is because one of the dark sorcerers from Mortal Kombat decided to resurrect him to fight in this tournament. I can totally see Shang Tsung or Quan Chi doing something like that. That sentence was way harder to say than you might think. Seriously, try saying see Shang Tsung five times fast. I bet you can't do it. Consequences. Katana. Almost at the end of the roster, and there's still some major names who have yet to appear. You've got to include Katana. She's the queen of Adenia, one of the most important characters to the overarching storyline of Mortal Kombat, and again, she's got a good and bad version that could fit the two grooves. Or if you don't want to go with the idea of dividing the grooves up by good and evil, you could have the Street Fighter groove be a more classic version of the character, looking like her old self from the original games, and then you can make her Mortal Kombat groove a more royal version of her that leans more heavily into her Edenian heritage, looking a bit more like she did in Mortal Kombat 11. But the big reason that you want to include Katana is because if you have Katana, then you can also have... Just trying to reckon why the hell you're back. A million souls cried out for my return. Melina. The final character on the Mortal Kombat side is the character I would have to be crazy to leave out because I was paying attention during Mortal Kombat 11. Yet when Melina didn't come back initially for Mortal Kombat 11, the fan outcry was massive. Outside of Scorpion and Sub-Zero, I honestly don't know if any other character being absent from the game would have caused such an uproar. So of course she has to be in here. And as for her two grooves, have the Mortal Kombat groove be her more classic crazy berserker self, have the Street Fighter groove be her later MKX self who is trying to rule Outworld. But there's one other reason to include Melina. Because she would make for a great rival fight against our final Street Fighter character, Jury. I don't think the Street Fighter fans love Jury as much as the MK fans love Melina, but it's close. They are both way up there. Heck, she's literally the only non Street Fighter 2 character returning to the base roster of Street Fighter 6. Which is kind of sad. Seriously, Capcom, you have to move past Street Fighter 2. But it does mean that she has some crazy levels of appeal if she can break through that restriction. 
And as I said, I'm not trying to come up with rival fights in here, but Juri is a psychotic killer who draws pleasure from what she does and she's decked out in purple. Yeah, she and Melina are a perfect matchup and they either have to fight or team up in the story mode. I don't care which one it is, but it has to happen. And as for her two grooves, Mortal Kombat groove is her classic Street Fighter 4 self who is a Cheshire Cat killer, and her Street Fighter groove is a more modern day self because it feels like Capcom is trying to make her more of a chaotic neutral character in the modern games instead of chaotic evil. I don't exactly know what they have planned for her in the future, but it does feel like these are two good ways to divide up these variations. And there is your starting roster for Mortal Kombat vs Street Fighter. Akuma, Baraka, Blanca, Kami, Chun-Li, Cody, Cyrax, Goro, Jamie, Jax, Johnny Cage, Jury, Kano, Kin, Katana, Liu Kang, M. Bison, Melina, Nash, Poison, Raiden, Rose, Ryu, Scorpion, Shang Tsung, Sonya, Sub-Zero, Takeda, Vega, and Zangief. But hold up, we're not done just yet. Because remember, I said that we would have two boss characters, one for each side, who would then be available as pre-order bonuses. And first up for Mortal Kombat, yeah, this one is so obvious, I don't even feel like I need to say it. It's Shao Kahn. How could it not be Shao Kahn? You want to talk about not just the biggest boss from Mortal Kombat, but one of the most recognizable and infamously brutal final bosses in fighting game history? It's Shao Kahn. Listen, I love some of the weirder bosses in here. I actually got a big soft spot for Onaga, and heck, I'll even say I didn't mind Shinnok. But nobody is toppling Shao Kahn for the title of most famous Mortal Kombat boss. So if this is indeed supposed to be the biggest faces of these two worlds colliding, he has to be the one at the top of that tower that our heroes have to overthrow. Also, he is a super safe bet, and by picking this safe bet, it helps soften the blow of the very weird pick I have coming up for our Street Fighter boss, Nikali. Okay, hold up, hear me out. I am totally aware this is not a popular choice. People do not like Nikali. I've mentioned on the show a few times that Capcom did a popularity poll ranking everyone's favorite Street Fighter characters, and I usually bring that up to talk about who are the most popular choices, but I never bring up who are the least popular choices. And out of all the canon Street Fighter characters who appeared after the first game, Nikali is third from the bottom. Only Rufus and Birdie are lower on that list. So I know nobody would go into this game wanting to see Nikali, let alone as a boss, but I'm still picking him to be the boss of the Street Fighter side for a few reasons. First up, his origin is that he's an ancient entity that is reborn every several hundred years for the purpose of destroying. You want to talk about a character who sounds like they accidentally wound up in the wrong game? All Nikali is missing is someone saying they originated in another realm and he fits perfectly in Mortal Kombat. But also, Nikali's entire purpose is to track down strong fighters and consume them. If you are having an all-out war between the greatest fighters of two different realities, that's a banquet to him. He would be drawn to that like a bear to a picnic basket. Heck, in the story mode, you could have him end up devouring a bunch of old reject Mortal Kombat characters in the lead up to the big battle against him to explain why he's so strong. You know Ed Boon would jump at the chance to have a cutscene of this guy eating Su Hao. Not to mention like half the villains in Mortal Kombat devour their enemies' souls. Again, Nikali is a perfect fit for this world. But the other reason I'm picking Nikali as the Street Fighter boss is because this guy needs a redemption. He was set up to be the big baddie of Street Fighter V. He even has the Roman numeral V tattooed all over his body. Only to appear once, grunt like a caveman, make Ryu feel sad, then Ryu appears again, punches him in the gut, and then he dissolves into a pile of goo, and the game then becomes about trying to take down M. Bison for the seventh time. Capcom, I swear to God, if Street Fighter VI ends with JP exploding and then M. Bison steps out again, I'm going to walk into the ocean. So Nikali might be the winner of the title, character with the most wasted potential of all time. And since it is very unlikely that he'll ever return in the mainline games again, I say put him in here and make him as big of a threat as you can and give him one final chance to redeem himself. So there's your full cast, plus pre-orders and bosses, and if I may say so myself, it's a perfectly fine roster, but it is missing something. You all know me, I love to throw in there the weird picks, the interesting choices that get people talking. But on this roster, well I got Cody and Poison who aren't that weird, but they're at least not the names you'd expect. But on the Mortal Kombat side, yeah it's pretty much just the greatest hits, and there's a reason for that. 
Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter have very different starting roster sizes. 15 Street Fighter characters is almost how much 5 and 6 are launching with. Mortal Kombat, on the other hand, yeah, the last Mortal Kombat to launch with 15 or fewer characters was Mortal Kombat 2. So, sadly, we couldn't get any really big deep dives or surprising choices in here. Which means we need to make up for that in the DLC. Yes, it's time to talk about DLC. Now, normally I like to do a few seasons of DLC, and I usually say about six characters per season is a fair number. However, I also like to try and be realistic, and the last two Capcom crossover fighters both only got one season of DLC. And NetherRealm games don't even do season passes, they do combat packs. But even then, you're not going to get that many of them. So yeah, we're only going to stick with one season. Unless we can somehow use a season two to introduce Ed Boon to another 80s celebrity. That's a very weird sense, and yet it's kind of real. Although I will say, NetherRealm DLC does tend to be pretty big, so even if we're only getting one season here, I think it would be safe to say around 10 characters could join. Five from Street Fighter and five from Mortal Kombat. So let's go ahead and take a look at what characters we can throw in here to really spice things up, and let's begin with the Mortal Kombat side. First up, going to start with Jade, another one of the major recurring characters in the series. She's actually grown and developed a lot in the story as this series has gone on, and her staff makes her a skilled martial artist who I could easily see stepping into the Street Fighter games. In fact, I'd say let's have her Street Fighter groove focus more on her bow staff, while her Mortal Kombat groove uses more projectiles and mystical abilities. Next up, Cabal. I personally love Cabal. I've always had a thing for speedsters, and I always thought that mask was really cool. But if you're going to get someone in your Mortal Kombat game to represent their seedy criminal underworld, it's going to be Kano. So sadly, we had to save Cabal for the DLC, but I still think he's a great addition to this roster. I mean, the Mortal Kombat characters all know his tricks by now, but imagine the Street Fighter characters actually facing down someone with super speed. Sure, Ryu is fast enough to dodge bullets, but that's nothing compared to Cabal. I would love to see their reactions to having to fight someone like this. Next up, we need another ninja. It's one of the things that this franchise is known for. They've got the entire Shinobi rainbow being represented. And that made picking this third ninja incredibly hard. Because while I personally love Ermac, and Smoke has got some strong lore elements behind him, and Noob Saiba has got some really cool mechanics, and Trimmer is brand new, so he needs some more focus, and Rain was named after a Prince reference, and I don't need to explain why that's cool. End of the day, the ninja who is most worthy of coming in third behind Scorpion and Sub-Zero is Reptile. He's one of the first secret battles in fighting game history. His reptilian design has changed greatly over the years, which translates to tons of potential customizations. And he's also unique enough that you can see some good exchanges between him and the Street Fighter characters who have never seen anything like him before. And as for his variations, make the MK version one of the later more reptilian designs, while the Street Fighter variant is the more classic human-looking version. Now okay, only two more Mortal Kombat characters left, and I said in this DLC we needed to get weird. We needed that pick that would make people talk. But so far, Jade, Cabal, Reptile, they might not be leading faces, but they're still some of the strongest supporting characters in the series. So I need to roll up my sleeves and dive into MK's more bizarre, forgotten history of characters. And that means the 3D era. Yes, the 3D era of Mortal Kombat introduced so many new fighters, who were immediately lost to the sands of time. Don't get me wrong, some of them managed to live on in the more modern games. Kenji Return, Tiny Return, Frost Return, Bo Raicho Return, even though we probably shouldn't have. But there's still so many more characters who could come back, but it looks like they're doomed to be locked in the PS2 Xbox era. So let's throw one of them in here, and out of all the old 3D characters, I'm going with Nitara. She's a vampire and she's a pirate. Listen, I'm a simple man. You say vampire pirate and I'm instantly paying attention. I'd say this is my one just for me picking this roster, but again, I want to include someone from the 3D era who hasn't returned yet, and out of all those remaining contenders, yeah, I don't think many people are going to argue against Nitara. I mean, we got Boring, Gross, Your Own Creator Hates You, I Don't Know Who That Is, You'd Only Be Here For One Joke About How You Look Like Ken, you're actually cool, but you have a decaying skull to face that would keep us from being able to sell this game in certain countries. I only know you from the memes. Yeah, I think Natara wins. And that brings us to the final moral combatant. And we need a big name to go out. I also want someone a little bit odd again. Someone unexpected who would get people talking. 
And who better to do that than a boss? But we already got Shang Tsung and Shao Kahn, meaning we don't really have that many other bosses to pick from. Shinnok returned for Mortal Kombat X, but even then, I still never really hear MK fans talk that positively about him. Blaze was just a big pile of fire, and yeah, no, we need something a little bit more interesting. So I'm going to go with Onaga, the original ruler of Outworld. He's a massive wall of power, he's one of the more intimidating bosses in the series, but he's fallen like so many other characters before him into the pit of forgotten 3D fighters. So if you bring this guy back as the final character, it would be a huge shock. Nobody would see it coming, and when your DLC can surprise people that much, it definitely pumps some more life into your game. And that leaves us with five Street Fighter characters. Again, we got a few more characters I feel could count as mainstays, but I still want to throw in some unique choices. First up, Guile. He's probably the biggest Street Fighter character I left out of the main roster, simply because he does have some similar moves to Nash, and I feel like Nash is the more interesting choice, especially with the whole Frankenstein thing and how that could tie into Outworld. But it's Guile. He's big enough and important enough that he needs to make it into this game somehow. Not to mention, he's been the big military guy leading his own forces against the bad guy in Street Fighter for several years now. You know he and Sonya and Jax would all work well together. Also, it would be interesting to see how Guile's playstyle could change in the Mortal Kombat groove simply because yeah, Mortal Kombat doesn't have charge attacks, so you would have to turn his Sonic Boom into something like Back Back Forward Punch, or his Flash Kick would be Down Down Up Kick. This would be interesting because it means that in this game, people who hate playing as charge characters would finally have a version of Guile that they might enjoy, which is kind of the whole point of the groove system, giving players a new way to experience a character. Next up, Sagat. He's a big threatening bully style character who would be great to see clash with the Mortal Kombat characters. I mean, He's one of the only characters who could actually tower over Shao Kahn. And for lore purposes, Sagat went on a quest for peace to atone for all the bad stuff they did in the earlier games, so it would be great to see him running up against characters like Shang Tsung who might want to reignite that evil inside of him to manipulate him for his own goals. And as you can probably guess since we're dividing these grooves up by good and bad versions, the Street Fighter groove would be his modern day self who searched for redemption, his MK groove would be his classic bad guy persona. Next up, time to get a little bit more out there, Sea Viper. She's another fan favorite from Street Fighter 4 who didn't end up returning for Street Fighter 5, and as of right now, it doesn't look like she's coming back for Street Fighter 6 unless it's a few years down the road. So you know what? Let's give her one more chance to shine. Plus, she's a secret agent who specializes in investigating whatever the big villain groups are up to. As soon as these wizards from another reality start coming through portals, you know her employers would ask her to investigate and try and figure out how they can get their hands on this power. Also, C Viper would be a good character to experiment around with because since she has only been in one game, we can't really divide up her grooves by different versions of her. So we'd actually have to invent some new moves for her for the Mortal Kombat groove, letting C Viper fans have something new to play around with. Next up, if we add Onaga as the big boss pick for the DLC, then we need another big boss from Street Fighter. And considering that 60% of them have all been Bison, our options are kind of limited. But I think Gil would be the perfect fit. Heck, he might actually be a better fit for the Street Fighter boss than Nikali. But let's be real, people will pay DLC money for Gil, not for Nikali. So yeah, let's give Gil the DLC treatment and maybe add some extra story elements in there for him like they did in Mortal Kombat 11 when they add Shang Tsung as DLC. Because I can totally picture building something new around our big red and blue Fabio. He's obsessed with destiny and believes he's the one chosen to lead this world to salvation. So the moment he learns that there is a literal hell world out there, he'd want to lead a one-man quest to cleanse it from reality. Or heck, he believes that there's some big shiny nirvana out there that he's destined to lead people to. That kinda sounds like Adenia to me. Gil might actually see these portals opening up to these other Mortal Kombat worlds as a sign. So let's have the plot of the base game be that Outworld is trying to invade the Street Fighter world, but then we put out a DLC storyline that revolves all around Gil, and he's now trying to invade Outworld. And when it comes to his playstyle, this one's easy. One group would give him extra fire attacks, one group would give him extra ice attacks. He is perfectly designed for this. Heck, just thinking about those powers, you know the best way possible to advertise this DLC would be to put out a big poster of Gil fighting both Sub-Zero and Scorpion at the same time. You in your DLC trailer with Gil walking out, holding Scorpion around the neck with his ice side and Sub-Zero around the neck with his fire side? That's gonna sell some copies. 
And that brings us to our final Street Fighter character, and like Mortal Kombat, I still feel like I haven't gotten that weird of a pick in here yet. I haven't put in here someone that would really make people perk up and do a spit take. Well, there's a handful of characters who I feel could get that reaction, but I've gotta aim for the stars on this one. I've gotta get as weird as I possibly can. And because of that, the final Street Fighter character is Q. This guy hasn't been in a game since Third Strike and has remained one of the biggest mysteries in the Street Fighter universe. Who is he? What is he? Is he a hero? Is he a villain? What is he up to? Nobody knows, but he's got creepy Darth Vader breath and he punches like a truck. And because of this mystery, it's hard to put him in anything for fear of contrasting with whatever Capcom has planned for him. But a Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter crossover is so far out there that putting him in here as DLC seems like a perfect fit. Just have him pop up in here, no explanation of why or what he is. Heck, play up that mystery and have Mortal Kombat characters walking around saying, I face demons, nothing scares me. Except for whatever this thing is, that guy freaks me out. Heck, if you pick the Mortal Kombat group for him, just have his arcade ending be that Sonya Blade is giving a presentation on him to her special forces, exactly like the arcade ending for him in Third Strike. This is maybe the only place we could ever possibly put Q again since it could totally lean into his mystery and we wouldn't have to explain anything. And it's a crossover, so none of it can anyways, so no matter what we do with Q in here, it wouldn't affect anything. So there are your 10 DLC characters. And before we go, just going to throw this out there real quick, I'm sure someone is suggesting that we should include a guest character as well because Ed Boon loves to include really far out there guest characters in his Mortal Kombat. And if this crossover did happen, I'm sure he'd demand that they put in their guest character as well. But how do you do a guest character in a crossover game? In fact, why would you do that? The entire point of a crossover is to focus on two franchises coming together. Why would you want to muck all that up by including a third franchise and just shoving it in there? That would just be weird. You'd have to be crazy to do something like that. Especially if you try to do it in the base roster. Can you imagine how foolish that would make you look? It might as well be a console exclusive character too. God, the idiocy behind a decision like that. <sighs> you big... Big idiots. But I think I have a compromise. Considering this is a crossover with Street Fighter, I'd say letting Ed Boon have access to the Capcom catalog would still fit pretty well with the theme. So let's make the guest character Leon Kennedy. Resident Evil characters would fit Mortal Kombat the best out of all the popular Capcom franchises. The RE4 remake is huge right now, and we know Leon is no stranger to kicking and suplexing monsters, so he'd fit just fine. And with that, we finally come to the end of today's roster. This has been one of those crossovers I've been meaning to get to all the way back when this show started, so doing it today for our third anniversary felt like the perfect time to break it out. And speaking of that, I want to thank everyone out there who has stuck with this channel over the past few years. We're aiming to hit 80,000 subscribers by the end of the year, and it's because of all of your support and giving us thumbs up and sharing our videos that we are even close to being able to hit that number. And as always, let me know what you think. Who should have been in this roster? How big should it have been? What should the story be? What Street Fighter character would have the most brutal fatality? I'm guessing Hakan and Noah will not elaborate on that. Let me know all that and more down below. And you can also follow me on Twitter and Tumblr and Instagram at Thorgy's Arcade or on Twitch at Professor Thorgy. Thanks again for tuning in, everyone. Stay safe out there and come back next time. <laughs>